right. Welcome to Black Men Speak. I'm your co-host, the J.R. Stewart. And I'm your co-host, Tommy D. Duncan III, or TD3. Ladies and gentlemen, it is Wednesday, September the 21st, 2022. Jimmy, and if it's Wednesday evening. It's Black Men Speak, Tom. So let's give a big shout out to Liquid for providing our theme music to uh, Forest Films in our own studio uh, for uh, sponsoring our virtual studio. And Tom, um, for those out there, if you haven't already, please like, share, and subscribe to our channels uh, on YouTube, Facebook, uh, well, Twitter, uh, Twitch. I think those are the four platforms that we're streaming on live. And uh, also spread the word. And if you haven't already figured out, people, every week we bring on serious guests. We talk about serious topics. And like Keisha Jones says, we are not for play play. Um, so please help us grow this channel because we're trying to be an instrument of good for the black community. So, Tom, why don't you uh, introduce the topic and our guest, and we'll get started. All right, folks. We have an exhilarating topic for us this evening with an extremely sharp brother who has been here before, uh, the one, the only, Llewellyn Austin Berry, another great ag, another great, another great alpha man. And we're going to talk cybersecurity, folks, this evening. We've actually had... Uh, Mr. Derry on before to talk about some foundation issues with security that actually put a scare in me, but we're going to dig a deep, a little bit uh, deeper on this and we're going to peel back the onion a little bit. Talk a little bit about cybersecurity and social media and the impact that it has on our daily lives, but more important, what might be happening to your data as you're out there surfing the net and on these social media channels? Welcome, Lou. Welcome back. Hey, thanks for having me again, gentlemen. Glad to be here. Appreciate the opportunity. So we are going to start off by giving people, for those who are not the so-called propeller heads out there who don't get into cybersecurity, but who are definitely out there in the cyberverse, a general overview of what cybersecurity is all about. Talk a little bit about social media and what's happening with your data, what you need to know and quite frankly, hey, if you need to make some decisions about what you're putting out there, not just for you, but your family as well. So why don't we start off, Lou, telling us a little bit about what you do, your background, and then use that and talk about what people need to understand about cybersecurity in general. So thanks again, Tommy. Um, I have uh, 25 plus years in the cybersecurity field. I got my first uh, introduction to firewalls in 1995, became a certified engineer and uh, just has been going gangbusters since then. Uh, I was with AT&T and helped launch their uh, international managed security service practice. I've been with Hitachi where I help uh, uh, design and locate their first North American security operations center. I was Raytheon over cyber R&D. Uh, currently, I'm with Dallas Baptist University. I'm both their chief information security officer as well as an adjunct professor. They're teaching uh, multiple classes in cybersecurity. You know, what this means is that uh, Brother Lou was in cyber before, before cybersecurity was cool. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's been a minute. It's been a minute. It's never dull. It's never dull or boring. So when we talk about cybersecurity, what does that mean and, and how does it play in our daily lives? So cybersecurity can be used interchangeably with information security. Uh, you probably heard the both terms used uh, coterminously in, in literature or on TV or internet, but basically is the protection of information. It's how do you or whoever you use, your service provider uh, or whoever you contract with or partner with, do they protect your information? So we always think about things that we don't want out in the open. We don't want our name, our address, our social security number, our driver's license number, any of our personal information out on to the public unless we actually put it out there. Where when you, when you put your information out there, the question is, how are you defi or how are you validating where you're putting is actually going to protect your information. So in essence, uh, information security or cybersecurity is the protection of information that you deem important and critical and confidential to you. And that's the 10,000 foot view. Okay, that sounds good. And so we live in the, in the universe, the cyberverse. 
most people have, I don't know, if you're talking about just the older generation, probably at least three or so different uh, accounts in the cyber world. Uh, you know, LinkedIn for folks who are business professionals, Facebook who want to stay in contact with their family and friends, and, you know, maybe Twitter or one of the other folks or one of the other platforms. But, you know, when we come to our younger folks, I mean, my God, I don't know, probably at a minimum five or six. And we talk about what you put out there and what needs to be protected and or secured. What have you been seeing? And this space moves extremely fast. What are the top two or three issues right now that you see that have been bubbling up that people have really been talking about? Well, from my perspective, the most troubling um, thing I see is really apathy among this younger generation about their private information. Um, they really don't, uh, especially in college and university campus, a lot of them really don't take cybersecurity seriously. It's not a matter of, do you need to be, like you said, a propeller head? You don't need to be a propeller head to take it seriously, you just not have to know the consequences or the impact of your information, what I call getting out in the wind. So number the number one thing that I see out there that's kind of troubling is apathy. The second is we as a as an industry, when I say the industry, I don't mean the cybersecurity industry, I mean corporate America in the US, our defense is not keeping up with the bad guy's offense. So, like I said, I've been uh, in the mid 90s uh, and even in the early 2000s, I am seeing tools and tactics and 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 and, and uh, trade craft that are just effective in 2022 as they were in 20 and 20, 2002, which is troubling. Now, it's not meant to say that, you know, no one cares. I'm just uh, from my observation, we're not keeping up or taking seriously what could happen to us because more than likely they're rolling the dice that hey it won't happen to me it's going to happen to somebody else i'm too big i'm too small they only do they only hack the big guys or i'm in this industry they don't care about us or, or whatever the case may be uh, but those are the two biggest things that i see Tommy. and you brought up a very good point <clears throat> individuals who think you know really this is for the big guys the you know the googles the microsofts and things of that nature i mean they're really attacking large mega billion dollar companies or even you know large you know hundred million dollar companies why would they care about little old me or individuals well the biggest and I, I tell this to my class over and over again there's predominantly not exclusively but predominantly two reasons why uh individuals or companies are hacked basically two reasons number one they want to steal information from you or number or like your credentials your credit card information i mean the list goes on and on what they could steal from you but number two they want to use you as an anonymous proxy to steal from somebody else and what i mean by that is so jimmy and tommy you are good friends but i know that tommy uh locks this stuff up real tight and everything but jimmy maybe not so much but they're good friends they share information on their laptops their applications it is very easy for me to hack into jimmy and then I can go cross over to Tommy because I can see what Tommy and Jimmy are sharing. I can get anything I want from Tommy. That's an anonymous proxy. And then he, if if he, if Jimmy takes his phone and does some forensics on it, I'm sorry, if Tommy takes his phone and does some forensics on it, he's going to see, Jimmy, why are you attacking me? And Jimmy's saying, I didn't do anything. So That's in layman's terms, you, you talk about doing forensics. And, and talk to me in layman's terms. Okay, sorry. Uh, and, and I'm talking for our listeners as well. <laughs> no problem. No problem. <laughs> What are you talking about, Willis? <laughs> so forensics. I made you myself, okay? <laughs> yeah, no, no worries, no worries. Uh, forensics. Everyone probably has seen some episode or some variation of CSI, where you basically find out the details of what happened in an investigation, be it a murder or a computer forensics. So basically, you're looking at the metadata or the data or the logs or all the activity that happened on a device. It could be a computer, smartphone, cell phone, a smart tablet, whatever the case may be. So the forensics basically tell you everything that happened if they weren't erased. And that's a big that's a big if right there because there's a, a bulging industry, industry called, or sub-industry I should say, called anti-forensics. And in anti-forensics, these are hackers that specialize in erasing their tracks once they hack onto your network, mm -hmm. anti-forensics. So in, in layman's terms, forensics, uh, call it the footprint or the fingerprint of everything that happened on your device. 
Now, <clears throat> you mentioned anti-forensics. <clears throat> Someone going in, doing something malicious, and then uh, sweeping their tracks. But let's talk about, you know, everyday, you know, social media users who put stuff out. Oh, okay, well, you know, I, I could just delete that, erase that. Um, let, let's talk about that when we hit that delete button. And for older folks, younger folks, what's at stake when you talk about folks who are going in and getting access to your personal data? Why, why should they care if they're like, well, I'm on Facebook, that's how I keep up with all my family and friends, or hey, I'm on LinkedIn trying to make, you know, build professional networks where I can find a job or just keep up with old colleagues. What's the big deal? So when you talk about privacy on social media networks, you need to teach think of it in two different channels, because sometimes we uh, mistakenly conflate the two. There's the privacy of logging into your account and what you provide, what you post. You know, if you're going to post your birthday out there, that's another data point that someone has to do research on your background. If you're going to post your the year you graduated, the high school you graduated, all that's so all that is data that they can be used to research against uh, research you. Now, you have voluntarily put that out there. No one's held a gun to your head or anything. You have voluntarily posted out there. That's one channel of privacy. The other channel of privacy is what's getting sold on the back end. So everyone knows, well, I won't say everyone, most people know that when you're on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, uh, you're the product that's being sold. All of your actions, all your movements, all your activities, et cetera, uh, all of that is being sold and resold over and over again to companies throughout the U.S. and Western Europe, China, Russia, and the list goes on and on. So when you look at privacy, you have to look at it in those two channels, what you voluntarily post out on that social media platform versus your movement, your activity, your purchases, your geolocation, all the other things that are being sold on the back end to who knows, God knows who. Gotcha. No, that's that's definitely interesting stuff. Um Let's talk about, and I know that you you actually are an adjunct professor and you talk to your young folks all the time. So let, let's talk to our Gen Zs and our millennials. Uh, of course, these, you know, these are folks who grew up on technology. They grew up swiping, you know, unlike us. Why is this important to them? I mean, they are extremely technologically savvy. You know, they put a lot of stuff out there. You know, they, uh, they can reverse engineer stuff. What about social media privacy and their brand long term do we need to be having a conversation about and what are you sharing with your students and other folks in gen z millennial in particular in that community that we need to have a a raw dog conversation about so what i let them know is are you comfortable being tracked do you do you realize you're being tracked do you realize what does that mean? And what does that mean when you say track? Okay, good, thank you, sorry about that. So on your phone, on your smartphone, I don't care if it's iPhone, and iPhone does have more protections than Android, but whether you're iPhone or, or iPhone or, or Android, your movements based upon where you surf, the applications you use, the data that you produce is collected by multiple companies, both here in the US and overseas. And that, that, that data and well, that data is sold and resold to build a profile on your buying behavior, what you what you look at, what you view. There are what I call uh, unauthorized cyber biographies of your activity on the internet by multiple companies, and they can go back. I mean, let me give it. Let me give an example. So, what if you know Tommy and I have been knowing each other, you know, good friends for the last forty years. Now, here's the thing: if I told Tommy, hey, Tommy your daughter your 12 year old daughter i have the last two years of everything she bought every website she went to every picture she posted every facebook post everything she looked at if i told that to tommy we probably wouldn't be friends much longer because that is critical information that i now have about his daughter that oh by the way i'm going to sell to my buddy in china my buddy in iran my buddy in korea and the list goes on and on and so, what do they do and what do they do with this information so, well, the, and, and not to be coy about it, but really anything they want. I think, it, here's the thing, they can find you wherever they want if they're tracking your geolocation, if you have that turned on and depending on the applications and settings you use. They have your buying behavior and they can yes. 
and they are sending data. And I mean, there was there was a, there was a experiment done where a guy, uh, I think it was a 60 or 70 year old guy, just opened up a brand new browser and start shopping everything that he can on diapers. Now he has nothing to do with diapers, 60 year old man. All of a sudden he gets email from companies trying to sell him diapers. Right. So these yeah. are things, this activity is what you're being tracked and sold and marketed to. And let me give you kind of the extreme case. I'm not, I, I will never say this is not gonna happen, but there is talk even in Texas, I don't know how broad your audience is, but there's talk in Texas of prosecuting women who actually go to abortion clinics because they can track their movement on their cell phone. Yeah. That's the type of metadata that can be collected about you as a, as a US citizen. You just think you're a private citizen, but everything about you can be uh, not just um, identified, but sold and amalgamated into a profile about what you do every day. And, and, and Professor, speak on this, on the speed that this happens. Um, if I go on Google and start searching for a car and then log into Facebook a minute later, I start seeing car ads for the car that I was searching for on Google. Yes, I mean, it's like they, it's not, it's not like Google's collecting the data. It then takes a long time to move that over to Facebook for them to analyze or do something with it. This is happening at the speed of light. The real time, <laughs> especially between the big guys, Google and Facebook and Twitter, real time connections about how they would, again, what I, what I coined the, the unauthorized cyber biography of mm -hmm. you as a surfer or as an internet user. And it's that profile that they are trying to monetize. All this is about, I mean, Queen Latifah said it first, all hail the almighty dollar. That's what it's all about. So they're trying to monetize every click you make on your inner, on your laptop or every touch you make on your, your cell phone, on your smart pad. All of that is in the in essence of being trying to monetize your behavior and give them to get products and services in front of you to purchase. Now, in their defense, they'll say, tech will say that they're doing this for your benefit. So rather than target you with marketing that's not applicable to anything that you're interested in, they're uh, honing in, you know, sharpening the, uh, the results so they can target the things that you are interested in. Yeah, and I've heard that for, uh, you know, at least 10, 15 years. And here's the question. Here's my retort to that. I didn't ask you that. True. You know, if I if I walk through a North Park Mall and I just walk in the door and all of a sudden every vendor in that mall comes to me and sorry, you want to buy, you want to buy, you want to buy, you want to buy. I would walk out of that mall because that's essentially what's going on. You follow? Yes. Now, let's say you know, they now if I was searching the Internet. And let's say I was looking for a pair of basketball shoes, then I'm only going to get the Foot Locker and the, you know, I'm going to get the athletic store. They're going to come to me. You want to buy, I've got a coupon here, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not so sure I want all of my information, at least speaking as a, an individual, I'm not sure I want all of my information out in the public like that on where I, what I'm looking at. Now, the, port, the, the issue, the retort that I have, Jimmy, to those is they never ask us if that's what we want because. Tell me how you can turn it off easily and tell me how a layman can turn this off. Now, there's a, the propeller heads. We can go in and turn it off, but it's a continuous process of, of you have the clean cookies, clean cash, things like that. But mo the only mostly pro propeller heads get into that. And it's not just that, uh, uh, Professor. It's the other thing that gets me that annoys me sometimes is I'll go to lunch someplace, stop in and you know, at a place, get a sandwich or something. Let's say Schlosky's. And before I get home, I'm already getting uh, these notices asking me to rate my experience at Schlossky's. Right. You know, I mean, this is how, how they can track you down to the to the to the store location of where you are, and and already feeding you know, and let you know that they they're tracking you because they're asking you for a review of that place. And right. Then and the insult, the insult is that okay, if you, if you do the review, we'll give you five points. Like, five points for what? What can I do with five points? I don't know if I can redeem this any place, if I can spend it any place. Uh, it's like a false reward for, for you taking the time out to do a review. So they get the information, they get the review, and what do you get in return? You know, some points that you can't do anything with. Well, the points add up. You got to go there a lot. I mean, maybe like 300 points equals a free sandwich. I, I'm just making that up. But there's some, oh, algorithm, okay. there's some algorithm that the points equal a free sandwich. But you know what it's tied to, because I want you to try this as an experience, because I use Slotsky okay. as well. 
uh, is tied if you signed up and you purchased, signed up using, uh, for example, ordered online or had something delivered from Schlossky's, you gave them your credit card number, right? Uh, so I have not ordered that. online with Schlossky's. Uh, okay. I don't use their app. I never signed up with anything, but um, I think uh, Google locations, you know, I do have that turned on and mainly for my security for, so if I'm falsely accused of being somewhere that I'm not, I could always say you can go back and check my Google location history. But so I think Google location is sending me these reviews, but uh, that tracking definitely works. Yeah. If it's used by tracking, that's another thing. You can obviously turn that on and mm -hmm. off uh, theoretically. Uh, and I won't go into that, but yes, theoretically you can turn it off. Typically what Schlossky does is track you by your credit card. Because okay. you, you buy anything online, you all of a sudden you physically go in, use your credit card. Yeah, you'll get a survey, you get a coupon, et cetera, et cetera. Here's an experiment. Go to that same Schlossky's and use a different credit card or pay cash and see it, see if you get an email. How do they do this using your credit card? I mean, I, I appreciate you bringing this up because, you know, what I do after travel, you don't have to go to a hotel after rent a car, you know, something of this nature. I mean, it's like probably within a day, if that, after you leave, I mean, you're getting these surveys. I was like, you know, what is this? Airline. Well, it's the application that you sign in for. Like if you're a Hertz member or, you know, American Airlines member, yeah. every time, I mean, put okay. it this way. If I go out and search, like, you know, my wife is going to go, on, we're going to go on vacation uh, next summer. I've already looked at a couple of different locations. I will get an email within a day, more than no more than two days saying, hey, that location is now on sale. Here's the airfare. Because I, I'm a I'm a member of it. I'm a member of that airline. Right. So once you log in, and that goes for Slotsky's, I, I and I'm I'm a Slotsky's fan. I've ordered online, blah blah blah. But they have my credit card information. But if I go pay cash, I don't get any emails. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Okay. <laughs> so it's all tied. It's all, it's all tied together. And I, and I hate giving out my credit card information because I get tired of hearing some corporation got hacked and millions of records were taken and you know they're like well we'll offer you if you were hacked how do you know unless you're out there on the black market uh ch checking these things um that they'll offer you some kind of a, a security protection for a year or something uh, if you can prove your case but you know you guys should be should be uh, better guardians of people information um you know and it's for that reason that i don't use credit cards online anymore uh, you know i go order a, a virtual card from, um, from my credit card company, uh, so I can just issue them on the fly, use it, and then just let it expire in a, in a week or so. Right, right, right. Now, <clears throat> bringing that up, <clears throat> I literally got an email, I believe it was yesterday. Uh, so I use a um, software, Norton software, for my you know laptop. And I got an email yesterday from uh, them saying that American Airlines just got breached. I don't know if you heard about it. <laughs> and, you know, American Airlines and companies like this have a lot of your information. Whether you're talking about health care providers, things of that nature. And a lot of these folks, most of them, want your Social Security number. And, and I typically push back very hard because I was like, you cannot protect my Social Security number. <laughs> my question to you, Lou, what do you do? What options do you have? I mean, there are certain things I know. You need a credit card to pay for it. You know, you have to provide your address. When I can, I give them my P.O. box, you know, if I can, instead of my home address. Right. But, you know, your Social Security, especially comes to health care insurance and things of that nature. It's very, very um, difficult when they want extremely private information that you know cannot be. And don't need it. I mean, they're asking for it. Really, it's not applicable to anything that you're doing, transaction with them, but they're asking for it. Oh, it's very applicable to them because how it's more valuable when they resell it to their buddies in Iran. Right. <clears throat> I understand, understand what it's for. I, I, I understand your frustration. Uh, I mean, I'm not not pushing back or I'm trying to make light of oh, it. No, I get it. I'm just saying there there is a reason why they're doing this. And my thing is this. They say, well, we need to have your Social Security to you know authenticate your identity, so on and so forth. But when you get hacked, okay, what you gonna do for me? Right. No, it's you not if, mean? it's not if, but when. Tom, <laughs> as if you detected you've been hacked, you may be well, a victim of identity theft and you don't even know who, who was behind it. Whether it was American Airlines, was Target, or was some other company, you know what I mean? Because three months from now, who's gonna be talking about American Airlines getting hacked? But six months from now, you may discover your identity's been, 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 been taken. 
And who do you go back to to blame? Oh, we're sorry. That's about <laughs> all they can say. Change your password. We're sorry. <laughs> Yeah, what, what they do is offer you that protection that, mm -hmm. you know, that basically validates, yes, Tommy was hacked on, you know, June 1st, 2022. And anything after that, anything uh, after that breach date, he is not liable for blah, 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 blah. So there are things that they uh, try to mitigate. And it doesn't eliminate it, but it does mitigate your liability if someone does try to, uh, to do that. But I, you know, if anyone gets compromised, I'll tell them, you know, change your credit card, you know, get a new credit card. Uh, even maybe even change banks with, it, with your credit card if you're at Chase, go to Wells Fargo, whatever, uh, and swap that out if you were hacked or if your wallet is stolen or things like that, because they do come back. The, the hackers know they can keep your if if they, your contract, your free service with that credit monitoring company is for 12 months, they can come back in month 13 and just have a field day. True. Okay, now Professor, you have the you have the tackle one of the, one of the things that really pissed me off in this particular area uh -oh. and uh -oh. that is so i roll the mcdonald's and uh they have a special we can get this mcflurry and a burger and for two bucks or something and i shouldn't have been eating it so it was a sign from god uh, <laughs> but it, it was only applicable if you uh if you order from the app right so uh so i was like okay i'm just going to circle back around through drive through Download the app, you know, get it so I can get my 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 burger. It was a quarter pounder and cheese with uh, and a McFlurry. So I'm, I'm I'm determined to get this. I go to install the app. And they the want and the McFlurry Jim. and the McFlurry, man, and the McFlurry. <laughs> Those things are good. The Oreo ones, man. I'm telling you. Um, but they want access to your emails, your contacts. Um, your media files. They want access to the microphone, the camera. I'm like, I have to give up all of this access to get a $2, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> burger and a, and, a, and a dessert for two bucks. It was like the, 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 the price of this is just too much. So, I mean, I just stopped it. Um, but it's amazing how many applications are asking for so much access to stuff that's on your phone. It's like, no, I you, I, what does my context have to do with, 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 with me, you giving me a discount? Okay, you want to market to me. I have your app. You're sending me, you're pushing, you know, uh, notifications to the app. Okay, maybe you're pushing them to my phone also. But if I give you access to my contacts, now I'm exposing everybody I know to your marketing. Well, keep in mind, you, you, call, you may call that scary or intrusive. Let me tell you something a little, a little more scary, Jimmy. How many, you how many people, how many Americans do you think just flew by that and said, agree, 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 agree? Millions. Okay. Millions. So, so this this is, and I'm not trying to downplay this or even, you know, make a, a pejorative statement about this, but the majority of the activity or the reason why this we're in the state we're in, it is self-inflicted. It is mm. self-inflicted. Mm. So for, let me give an example. You can't. Um, you can't go to Facebook and say, why is all my information out there, blah, 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 blah. If you go look at your end user license agreement with Facebook, you will mm -hmm. see that they have the right <laughs> to see yes. any and everything to any and everywhere without telling you. So you can't go back and sue them. Privacy, pri no, the moment you click agree on that EULA, end user license agreement, that EULA, then you you basically waived all your rights. It's 2030. Yes, and, and here's the thing: read for those heavy Facebook readers. Read your EULA, read it, and I don't mean just skim it while you fall asleep. Get your cup of coffee and read those thirty-nine pages or however long it is. Read but professor, it it those EULAs are, are 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 ten, fifteen, twenty pages deep sometimes, and, uh, he, and you know no one's read all of those paragraphs, all those pages, and can understand all of the legal ease they throw in there. Uh, at some point, you may start off with the, with the intention, I'm going to read it and see what I'm getting into. And after three, four pages of that boring, esoteric nonsense, you just say, okay, because you want to get on the program and move on. But therein lies uh, what I'm, yeah, I agree with you. I, I don't disagree with you one, 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 one bit. But what I'm saying is in those details, you are giving them permission to True. do what they are actually doing 24 7, 365. And so, so the law should be that a, the average person and the average user, let's say the average age is 15 years old, is your collective average user of your user base, then you should be able to write those agreements in terms where a 15-year-old can, can read it and understand it. 
It should be that simple. Don't 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 bury me in legal talk and big words. I have to have a, a legal dictionary out trying to look all these words up to understand what I'm getting into. It shouldn't be that complicated to use your platform to say, hey, we're going to collect your, your personal information. We're going to sell it. Uh, any information, other information that we collect through other channels, we may sell it, sell it also. So just so you know that we're in the selling business, not in the uh, platform or, or at least of the business or just providing you with a free platform. And just as an FYI, we do have a caller. Uh, oh, okay, in. early. So we're going to go ahead and have her to introduce herself and ask her question and or make her comments. So if you could tell us who you are, where you are from, and what your question or observation is this evening. Hello, this is Hope Erie T. Hart from Oak Cliff, Dallas, Texas. Hope in the house. And we haven't talked to you in a while. Uh, nice to nice to uh, hear from. Uh, nice to speak to you. Um, I wanted to say that you know I try to educate people and especially older people uh, when they get on social media to and just like you said um, when you're talking about what you agree to, but you do have some controls and you just have to learn you know learn how to say no. Um, and I try to tell people that, that don't want to get on Facebook because they don't want, you know, everyone in their business. I can say, you know, I say you can be an observer on Facebook and not really have other people know that you're on there. When you click that, you know, the button that says, do you want to find friends? That's where the problem is. And I tell people that you can, you can, um, you know, um, register on Facebook, and when it says, do you want to find your friends, you say no. So, you know, that that doesn't, you know, you don't have everybody from high school and your your hometown on there. And, but a lot of people don't realize that, you know, everything that they ask, they say yes. Just like you said, most people just agree to everything. But if you, you know, so I say, I, I said no, and on a lot of apps, um, you know, I say, no, I don't want you to have access to my contacts. I don't want to find friends. So I pick and choose who I contact on, on that, uh, you know, on that app. And, and a lot of people, you know, don't know or are not sophisticated enough to know that you can do that. Even though I do know that Facebook does, you know, track too much information. Uh, but it is good to be able to find people sometimes in an emergency situation, you know. Um, but my, my question was about the airline situation. Um, the, uh, the privileged, um, the, the, I, I don't know what the terminology is, but where you're already pre-selected or already, you know, already have a status, um, with the airlines. Um, I thought that that was somewhat a way of, um, already having your information. Um, I forgot what the, the terminology is uh, now, and this all happened after, um, you know, after 9-11. Um, and, I, and I think one of the reasons why they asked for your social security number now with airline tickets is because of 9-11 and, and, and knowing and trying to know who's flying, or that's the reason that they say that they need that information is because of, um, you know, trying to get more tracking of people on, that are on, on airplanes planes after the tragedy of 9-11. So, but I think there's a status that you can have where if you put in that number, then you, uh, you don't, you don't have to put in the rest of the information. You're already a, uh, pre-selected flyer or some status that you have with the government of flying. And I, I wanted you to um, explain explain that that okay. Uh, category. Okay. Well, well, I've ne yeah, I've never, and I've, I've I travel very very frequently around the world, and I've never given them any airline, even when I flew Air France and and uh, and British Air, I never gave them my Social Security. And I'm a little curious on an airline asking now, if you have if you have a passport, yes, you will have to give them your, and that's the federal government, obviously, you have to give them your Social Security number to leave the country. If you are a TSA pre-screen or global traveler, which means you get to go through this line uh, or excuse me, a shorter line right. to get, get, get pre-checked, you know, instead of the long line at TSA for the your baggage check, yes, you will need your social for that because for obvious reasons, they're tracking people who are they're going to basically pre-admit. 
But an airline, if you're talking about like a Delta or a Southwest or a JetBlue or something, they, I can't think of a reason, and I've been flying for 40 years, I can't think of any reason why an airline an airline would need your social security number. There's no reason for that. Uh, yeah, I think she's talking about the TSA pre-screen. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, then if TSA pre said that, and, and again, it's, it's to, they're basically saying we approve you, we trust you more than the rest of the other people because of the information you provided to us. But I don't know if your information is any safer with the federal government. I mean, they've been hacked by the Chinese uh, where millions of retirees, me, federal me, retirees who got their information stolen. Let, let, me, let, me put, let me put this issue to rest. Nowhere is safe, period. There you go. Period. You heard, you heard it from the expert. There's nowhere on this planet where, because even the Russians are getting hacked. There are, there are hackers that are hacking the Russians. You, heard of, you guys have heard of Bitcoin about a month or two ago. There was a hacker that hacked a Bitcoin company that stole $4.5 billion B, Ouch. B, $4.5 billion from this Bitcoin company. So there is no place that is safe for your data, period. The only thing you can do is try to maximize the protection of your data. And the, the analogy I always use with my students is we all, you know, if you have kids and, you know, before they go out to school, let's say it's a, it's a cold it's January day, the only thing you can do is put a hat and a coat and gloves on them. That's not going to guarantee they're not going to catch the cold. But they'll be a lot safer than if you put them in a t-shirt and shorts going out on the January day to school. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah, That's the analogy. None of that is going to guarantee. It just mitigates the risk. And before we go further, we want to thank um, uh, Ms. Hope for calling in this evening. It's been a long time since we've heard from her. We want to thank Ms. Elisa Patterson for uh, chiming in on our chat session. Also, the winner, uh, Frederick B. Roberts Esquire. We thank you for joining in as well. Uh, there's one thing that uh, Mr. Freddie said, uh, the, doc the document he's talking about, the UDA, is written to cover them, not you. They are making sure they are prepared for any and everything. <laughs> yes. that, is one, that, is not, that is not only 100% true, that is 1,000% true. <laughs> gotcha. Okay, gotcha. okay, Professor, you have to talk about the, uh, the, the, you talked a little bit briefly about the money aspect, um, but we have page two of your PowerPoint. Uh, are you ready to really discuss so people can know just how much money we're talking about. Yeah, and I, I, you're not able to show it probably the graphics are not ready yet. Uh, page two formatted correctly. Page one did not. Okay. So on the page, you're talking about how much is your private information yeah, let me, worth? Let me, let me share with uh, okay. everyone first. Sure. Um, All okay. right. There we go. <clears throat> so starting over on the left hand side, um, if you have HBO Max, you know, you pay your ten dollars, fifteen, twenty dollars a month, whatever it is, and you multiply that right. times the ten or fifteen million users around the US, around the world, you can see where they made their that eight point five billion came from. If you Disney, if you have kids, you definitely got Disney. So you pay your fifteen bucks a month times twenty, thirty right. million people around the world, that's their money. Netflix, everybody's got Netflix. You pay your fifteen bucks a month. You see where that $31 billion comes from. Everyone uses, a lot of people use Twitter. How many people pay for Twitter? Anybody write a check for Twitter? Zero. Anybody yeah. got Twitter coming out of no. their MasterCard once a month? Yeah, they made $5 billion last year. Instagram, anybody anybody that hit their American Express or their Visa for a monthly bill from Instagram or Google? No. Never. And you see how much money they made. And then Facebook, the granddaddy of them all, nobody pays anything for base Facebook. But they made 118 billion dollars last year. So you got to think about you, you, what you. What I'm trying to communicate from this slide is there's an. Uh, I, I don't want to call it a sub industry because that may seem pejorative, but I'm gonna call it a sub industry of people or companies around the world that are buying and selling your information, and these are the prop. These are the, the companies that are profiteering from it. Does that make sense? Yep. So when you look at the economics, so it's a lot of money. <laughs> You look at the economics on this, this is absolutely massive. Yep, it's absolutely massive. And it, keep, keep in mind what the point I'm trying to convey here is this industry that's purchasing your private information has this cyber biography of you. And if going back to my original example, if I had all that information on Tommy's 12 year old daughter, he would feel uncomfortable, even though he's known me for 40 years, he would be uncomfortable with that, right? Now, what if I just told you 17 countries or com companies around the world have that same cyber biography on you? How would you feel? 
question for you. Yeah, it seems, for those it seems like selling information is more lucrative than uh, content selling. Then what selling, I'm sorry? Then selling content. I was saying uh, collecting and selling information is uh, seem to be more lucrative than those who are developing and selling content. Right. I, I, well, I haven't done the, I haven't done a comparison that you know theoretically that could be true, but keep in mind that a lot of this information is sold and resold again. So if I take, let's say your record, I'm just making up numbers here, guys. If I say your record is worth a dollar and I sell it to you know 500 people, I just made 500 dollars on that one record. Whereas content, right. you know, they're they're putting all kind of different you know, whatever it is they want out there, a dating service, uh, how to buy, how to design your own basketball shoe, uh, you know, how to design your own computer. I mean, a lot of, a lot of this other content is more, I would say more productive in nature than, uh, uh, than what we're seeing today. And we want to thank uh, Blue. I was just kind of looking at in general. And before we go, before we go Three companies you have to the left, HBO, Disney, Netflix. Oh. Mm -hmm. No, I was going to thank Fish. Blue Fish for, uh, yeah, Blue Fish for joining in. Great show. Wow, indeed. That chart says it all. And then for A. Brown, uh, information is gold. So we want to make sure that we uh, thank everyone who's joining yes. via chat. Again, if you want to call in, ask a the question. The phone line is open. Um, the phone line is open. We will uh, put the phone number down here just in case if anybody wants to dial in and uh, ask a question or to share their thoughts. All right, Jimmy, as you were saying. I was just saying, just from the chart, the content providers on the left, uh, HBO Max, Disney, and Netflix, compared to the information guys on the right, Twitter, Instagram, Google, and Facebook, it seems like the, the place to be is in the information business. <laughs> if you want to get into that, yes. If you want to get there, are many companies out there uh, I don't say many, but there are, there are a handful of companies out there that are masters at monetizing consumer data. Everyone knows what happened with the 2020 election. Uh, if, you heard of, if you haven't heard of a company called Cambridge Analytic, that's the one that got in trouble and they now defunct. Actually, they reopened and they opened as a new company yes. even before they filed Chapter 11. So uh, they've already restarted and are doing business in the UK just fine. So uh, they're monetizing. They being these companies are monetizing your private data day in, day out. One thing, there is a statistic, I, another statistic I looked up just for this call I wanted to share with you. So it's kind of hot off the press, if you will. The worldwide illegal drug market. Anyone want to take a stab at how big you think that is? Again, heroin, marijuana, meth, uh, all the, anybody want to take a guess how big that industry is worldwide? Mm, I'm going to guess maybe uh, 150 billion. I'd say maybe Are you 500, okay, half a trillion, half a trillion, as maybe of May of 2020, 500 billion. As of May of 22, I just found us pull this off. May of 22, 750 billion B, billion. That's worldwide illegal drugs. Mm. Okay. Now hold that. Put a we're, almost talking, we're almost talking about a trillion dollars. No. Okay. No. Put we a pin in that. Put a pin in that. Put a pin in that. Hold on. 750 billion dollars. Okay. Illegal drugs around the world. Anybody want to guess how big the you know, cybercrime industry is? Good question. <laughs> I don't know that one. Two, 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 two trillion dollars. As of year in 2021, six trillion dollars. Oh. Six trillion dollars. By, by, by 2025, it's expected to be 10.5 trillion dollars. Repeat that again. Oh. I mean, that, that oh. is mind boggling. So illegal drug market. That's you know meth, uh, heroin. Three quarters of a trillion. Yeah, seven fifty billion dollars. That was, I just pulled that up. May of twenty two, a statistic came up on that. For cybercrime, as of year, year in last year, six trillion dollars on its way to ten point five trillion dollars. Trillion. This is worldwide. Now okay, keep in well, mind, these are people that these are people and companies that are monetizing data and information that they resold. OK, this is not we're not talking about some, you know, teenager in the basement in the mom's basement doing all kind of fun stuff. This is a multi trillion dollar industry of stealing information. So you steal information and then you turn around and sell it legally and make money. Let me give you a real. Yes. Let me give you a real example. I had a client in Montreal 
I, I may have already said that to share this with your audience on, on my last call, but it just it, it just ran everything to ground truth. He said he literally had a and he was in a semiconductor business in Montreal. He had operations in China for about two or three years. He said I, he had to pull out of China because every time he had a new release or update, it was on the market there in China the next week. Mm, the, the next week. week. The next week, so he pulled out and went to Eastern Europe. He's now in, in Hungary, I think. In Hungary, yeah, in Hungary. And, and of course, nobody's paying licensing for his uh, development or his technology. Not if it's stolen. Not, well, they do it, but they sell <laughs> the fraction of the cost. You know, mm. it costs him. You know, one thing that you won't find in, in too much in China is R and D. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, well, you, you yeah, stealing yeah. from everyone else. You don't have to. Yeah, um, you got R and D. It's happening here in the U.S. over in the U.K. You know, we're we're pretty much the leaders in R and D between U.S. and U.K., but it's 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 being you know just stolen every every day of every uh, every, every week of every month by by the Chinese and, and, other, governments too, and other and other governments. And that's a pretty good business model. You you spend huge amounts of money in R and D developing new technology, and I come along after you develop it and steal it. And uh, hey, it's a it's a race to the market. I probably get into the market before you do, after exactly. I've stolen it from you. Just to give us some perspective, six trillion dollar market. This year in cyber, Six trillion. in cyber um, crime, yeah, criminal, in cyber crime, and they're expecting it to be was it twenty or twenty five trillion by when? Ten no. trillion. Ten point five trillion by twenty twenty five. Ten so trillion. A few by years by from now. Years. So in three years, it'll be the ten point five. I think it'll be larger than that, but I'm I'm, I'm just going to quote you the numbers I found. Okay, so just for folks who are listening, to put this into perspective. Six trillion today, ten trillion by twenty twenty five. What is the current gross domestic product of the U.S.? Twenty five trillion dollars. Twenty. Twenty one. Twenty one trillion. Twenty five. As, as, as of twenty twenty. Of the U.S. At the U.S., the gross domestic product of the U.S. in twenty twenty uh, was twenty one trillion. Oh, that was twenty twenty. Yes, twenty twenty two numbers is closer to twenty five. Right, I believe. So when you look at that type of scale, yeah, so advanced, it looks like we have another caller coming in. So wait just a second. <clears throat> All right. This is Tommy Duncan with Black Men Speak. If you could tell us your name, where you are from, and what your question or thought is. Can you speak up a little bit? I, I, speak can up. Barely, I can barely hear you. Can you speak up a little bit? Okay, it's Elisa Okay, we can barely hear you. We, we, there we go. You're, we can hear you better now. Can you hear me? Hello? We can hear yeah. you better. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. How do they get our information from you just signing up for Facebook? Is that how they're taking it and selling it? Short answer, yes, because they give me, I'm sorry, go ahead, sorry. Go ahead, Alisa. Go ahead, I'm listening. Oh, she's listening. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering. Mm -hmm. So let me give you two extreme examples. If you log in, let's say Tommy opens a Facebook account tomorrow and he does nothing with it. He doesn't go on, he doesn't friend anybody, he doesn't surf, he doesn't search for, try to buy something online, Facebook Marketplace, he does nothing. One year from now, there will be zero history of Tommy Duncan for Facebook. You with me? Now, the other side of that, let's say Jimmy Gale opens up a brand new Facebook Facebook account tomorrow, and he's on it. By the way, the average Gen Z is on, on social media two and a half hours a day. Just think about that. So let's say Jimmy is on three hours a day doing going everywhere, friending everybody, doing research, scanning everything for a year. That means your profile, Jimmy's profile, is housed by Facebook and sold by anyone whose credit card will clear. Mm. You with me? To the caller? Is it housed by Facebook and what? Yes, you to repeat it, please. So if if Jimmy if Jimmy searches for the next year or even the next six months, Facebook houses and stores everything that he everything I'm doing. Yes. On that on that Facebook account. And Facebook sells that to anyone who will buy it, any person or company who wants to buy it. There's a special um, category, you want to call status symbol, if you will, in Facebook for those who actually buy this type of information. That's how Facebook gets their money. That's how they got that $120 billion. They're selling this information 
by the movement of your your activities where you're going online because these companies and I'm, I'm saying plural to be specific once so you're talking about online, not just facebook but you're probably like instagram twitter TikTok, all, all, all of them well you know what and it's not just social media i tell you what go down to the county and file an assumed name for a business and see the next day you don't start getting advertisement especially security companies you know for that company our, our own our own governments are selling your information all the public yeah. information has been mined and packaged up and sold to someone. Well, keep in mind, especially for those callers in Texas, I don't know if you guys are getting the nine calls a week from people trying to renew your auto warranty, but that, yes. was, that, was, that was friends of your Texas government that sold the DMV, sold their list to these companies to, 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 to go call you. So they sold your information, they being the Texas government, sold your information to these companies to go try and, to sell you an auto warranty. And they almost got me because they made me almost uh, believe that my uh, my warranty was out. And I'm like, wait a minute, I think I, think I got two more years. I didn't go check on this. And uh, so, yeah, they're very good at what they do in, in making you believe that you're just about, uh, uh, your, yeah. your warranty is about expired and you need to call them and renew. I'm right. like, wait a minute, I need to check on this. Um, so I didn't know that. Uh, but, yes, I, I know the government collects our information and they're now getting into that business of selling our information to the highest bidder. Any other thoughts or questions? And also, I know many of the email uh, subscribers, Google and Yahoo, they are linked to the government to turn over criminal activity as well. I don't know if people know that, but they've got many police reports uh, get filed from those companies turning over people's information. But I'm a super millennial and a social media person but i was just also just the inside of this call is great because you just i know you put something in google then you see it on facebook yeah like you said google mm -hmm. acura then you see it but yeah i just that's good to know how they actually get their money because i'm just like are they selling us you know your name your email when you subscribe but they're selling what you're searching so thanks for the information and great show thank you thank you and I think you said this before during our last show, Lou. I mean, we, we you talked, and that was a great chart. You talked about Netflix, Disney, HBO Max. You know, it's the content that they're selling. And in our last show, you said, you know what, with these social media, it's you. They sell you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, here's the analogy I, I, I tell my class. So Everyone will go into Kroger and, and buy a gallon of milk. Let's just say you go into Kroger to buy a gallon of milk. The buyer is you. The seller is Kroger. The product is the milk. You with me? Right. When you're in Facebook, Facebook is the seller. Those invisible companies are the buyer. You are the gallon of milk. Yes. Uh, Tom, uh, uh, Hope just posted a comment. Uh, so let's get the professor to comment on DNA companies selling information or sharing information with law enforcement. Uh, okay. There have been a, a few cases where people have been, <clears throat> cold cases have been solved from uh, DNA information. Yeah. Okay. Good deal. Well, that, anyone, I mean, the, the, uh, the federal government, or the FBI, or any state government can get a court order to, from, to, from Yahoo, Google, whoever, uh, Facebook, whoever, to get access to your private records. Um, so that's not unusual. And 23D and, uh, 23andMe, all of that is nothing more than a court order. So that's not any different. I think some of them are sharing order. information without a court order, just sharing it. What? You mean like another individual? No, I think uh, some of them are just sharing information with, uh, um, like, for instance, um, if they have some DNA evidence from a cold case, and they don't have anywhere else to go. They'll turn to the DNA companies and say, "Hey, are there any matches on this DNA? Do, oh, do a yeah. test on this, and yeah. tell me if they're the brother out there, a relative, anyone close." Right. And there've been a couple of cases that have been cold cases that have been solved yeah. based on them just sharing the information. I don't even think uh, they're going with a, a court order to get the information. I think the DNA companies are just giving it to them. Well, the question is, do the people that provide the DNA give them permission to do that? Because I'm sure that's a good nice question. question. I'm pretty sure that. Yeah, you go. And it looks like we have a another caller coming in, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, get our probably our last caller for today because we have about five minutes. Oh, okay. 
This is Black Men Speak, Tommy Duncan. If you could, if you would tell us who you are, where you're from, and what your question or thought is. Hi, everyone. My name is Armanda Brown, and I'm calling from Dallas. And um, my question has to do with, um, so speaking about Facebook and social media and things and how we should move whenever we are applying for these different um, handles, if you will. So one thing that I like to do is to not really use my my information so i'll throw off my birthday by a few days or i won't like upload my my you know address but i may give you know some hints or whatever um would you guys say that that would be effective and kind of like helping to wear off some of this stuff or 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 am i fooling myself and thinking that i'm getting around the system well, you may be providing them, instead of providing them 20 points of data, you may be providing them 17 points of data. Yes. So it's the less data that they have, but they're mapping it against, if you use Twitter or Instagram or Google or other social media, all of that is interconnected. That inter information exists both independently in the, in the uh, social media company and interdependently by the agreements they have for buying and selling your information. So I'm not going to say it's bad. I'm just saying it's less less data points they have to track you. If you ever want to know how or get an idea on um, what's connected, why don't you change your email address on one of your Google accounts or one of your Facebook accounts and see what disconnects? <laughs> Do that. Interesting. And Any plus, other it is interesting. I haven't thought of that. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and thanks for calling in. Actually, this is. Uh, this is fam. This is cuz. Thank you for uh, joining in and thank you for uh, calling this evening. Any other thoughts or questions? <clears throat> Not right now, but I'm sure before this episode is over, I will think of something because I am in the insurance industry. So like our business is to make sure that, you know, everything is, is crossed and dotted, if you will. So this is particularly interesting to me. So I will, I will, I will continue listening in. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for calling in. Thanks for your support. And you know what doesn't change very often, Tom, for for most of our home PCs is our IP address, the mm -hmm. uh, the lease. You know, so if, if if data is tracked and uh, tied to your IP address, you can change a few data points. But through cross referencing, eventually, I can figure out if all these IP if, if your IP address is coming up with multiple data points and some of it conflicts, eventually I can figure out what the correct one is and what the fake one is. So well, um, it, it gets even deeper than that. They can know your browser version. They can even have you ever heard of a MAC address? MAC? Yes. So your MAC address doesn't change. Doesn't on your change computer. on your PC. Yes. So they, if you allow it they can track you by your MAC address and you could be here today and you can be in Boston tomorrow and you can be in Tokyo the next week and they still know, yep, that's Tommy. <laughs> wow. Uh, absolutely crazy. And will a, it, would hiding behind a VPN help? Professor? Yes, absolutely. I highly recommend, highly recommend. But be careful of the VPN because there are some bad VPNs out there. There's some VPNs that not only protect you but also collect the information. <laughs> you, you can't get away at all then. <laughs> so so we, we are, I mean, it's amazing. We are at the top of the hour. And so what I'm going to ask very briefly, Cliff, Cliff Notes, what are our best, best practices? How do we minimize, uh, I mean, obviously staying off of social media at all costs, but, you know, outside of that, what are other things we can do to at least limit our risk and exposure? Well, if you're going, I'm not going to tell you to stop, you know, Facebook and, and Twitter and all that. I'm not going to tell you that. I'm just making you aware that there is a cyber biography that's been built on your, on, you know, on, on your movement. Uh, in terms of password, I would at least go to 12 character passwords right now because there are passwords now that are eight characters long, all letters that could be cracked in less than 30 seconds. Uh, 30 um, seconds. Yeah, 30 seconds. Yeah. That just came out in June of this year. Uh, they studied passwords, so I would do at least twelve characters. That's uh, uppercase, lowercase, numbers, and symbols. Twelve characters, because there's too many, too much technology that can hack it, and you won't know many of the systems. You won't know that they're in because they have your password. It's just like it's the same thing as Tommy giving me his password to his Twitter account, and I'm logging in. So Twitter just says, "Yep, that's Tommy. That's the right ID. That's the right password. Please proceed." So if someone steals your ID and password, they're going to be emulating you. Uh, most likely at night when you're asleep, 
or even during the day, if there, if that service allows dual uh, dual access, they shouldn't. They sh but if some services do allow two different accesses at the same time, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, there's another recommendation I get, you know, from a corporate perspective is, of course, one, to have a different password. Use the long, long and complicated passwords. One is obviously to have a different password for every account. And then you got to keep up with these 100 passwords that you got. And so then they have these password vaults. What yes. say you, Brother Luke? What say like you? Like LastPass and what? Yeah. Vault, vault I 100% uh, endorse password apps because I would definitely recommend. Um, a pass a different password recite and i don't mean by changing by one digit don't just go one two three four five and then go one two three four six one that's not changing the password because the algorithms can guess your next did the changing of the digits many, many people actually only change it by a digit get you a password app that's going to randomize give you letters uppercase lowercase symbols 12 they i got some accounts that i have 33 character passwords on because what i'm protecting on that site is that is that important but i have an app that that all I had to do is open it up, boom, there's my password entered in, I'm in. Tell us about those, the, the apps you're talking about, because I think that's the challenge for most folks, is keeping up with these 50, 75 well, different passwords for all these apps. Tell us about without endorsing any of them. Yeah, just managing, just managing all that is the biggest challenge. Well, you can't manage it, uh, you, uh, some people manage it on paper. So I've seen some people manage an Excel spreadsheet, which is very scary. But the password apps are protected online. You can access them from your smartphone, from your laptop. They're, all you have to do is remember one major password to get into your account. Right. And the reason why I say that, let me give you an example. Uh, Mary had a little lamb of police was white. So that's M H A L. The first letter of all those words, boom, you now have a 12 character password. You know, add the year that you graduated from high school and maybe a you know, a dollar sign, four dollar signs. Now you got a 15 character password, but you can always remember Mary had a little lamb. Yes. Uh, you know, you can always remember in, if, if you're a Bible reader, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Use I, T, B, G, you know, just use the first letters, capitalize and lowercase, a couple of those letters. That's something very easy to remember. Here's another thing. If you can Google your password, you need to change your password. If right. Google returns a result from your password, you need to change that password. Because guess what? Google is also used in China, Russia, Iran, et cetera. Other than password management and best practices, what are other things that people need to consider to protect their identity tracking? And well, so like the other caller said, there was you had a caller in that said that you can adjust Facebook settings. I don't I'm not a Facebook user, so I really can't comment on that. I I, I have heard that they are, and I've seen commercials where saying they're protecting your privacy. I really think they're just decrease the number of data points they're tracking from you. And the reason why I say that is that um, if you, I've tracked Facebook and, and, and Google in Europe and the European Union is actually cracking down much more than the US yes. on privacy for European student, European uh, citizens. And they have fined Google and Apple and Microsoft billions, billions of, of dollars. dollars. Yes. for breaching privacy of European citizens. We're not going to do that in the U.S. because we, we're, we're business first, citizens second. But in Europe, they're citizens first, business second. So they're not going to have the same modality, they being Apple, Facebook, et cetera. They're not going to have the same algorithms in Europe as they will in, Europe, in the U.S. Gotcha. Well, Lou, man, I wish we could talk more, but we have run out of time. And so now we're going to have to commit to having you back so we can continue the conversation. <laughs> A problem, not a problem. I love it. I love it. All right, Jimmy, any uh, closing words before we uh, shut uh, no, this No, just uh, we, we appreciate Lou coming on once again. Uh, please come back um, and give us updates because, um, like you said, no matter where you are, you're not safe. So all you can do is uh, attempt to slow them down. Okay, and Lou, I'm just telling you right now, you, we're going to have to do a quarterly cyber update, bro. <laughs> not a problem. Be happy to, happy to join in. All right. So, so thank you very much. Good night, everyone.